Hey guys, welcome again. If you missed part one of my talk here on the Orthodox Church, I'd highly recommend you go back and give it a view before you dig into part two today. Now again, we're talking about Big O Orthodox Church, the official branch of the church called Eastern Orthodoxy. We're not talking about little O Orthodox, you know, the general word Orthodox that we use in terms of the right way of thinking or believing. So we all want to be Orthodox in that sense, in a sense of sound belief. But this series is about the Orthodox Church as an entity. And, you know, I had a great deal of wonderful things to say about our Orthodox brothers in part one. I share many beliefs. It's a stream of the church that has richly blessed me beyond measure for more than 20 years of my life. I talked about how I share their views on the original sin, original innocence issue, on hell, on the atonement, on their rejection of penal substitutionary atonement, about the inclusion of humanity in the incarnation. Uh, I, I share their love of the patristics, you know, the church fathers, not to mention the, the richness of their liturgical style of worship. I find it very aesthetically appealing. It appeals to my soul, okay? I, I've spent time with the monks on Mount Athos. I study Orthodox theology. So if someone is just tuning in to part two today, you're going to miss a lot of context. I may even sound as if I'm coming across as overly critical of our Orthodox brothers, but that is not my intent. Because, you know, I, I, I'm going to give the main reason why I'm not baptized into the Orthodox Church, because I agree with them on so many things. And I, and I want to touch on a few hotter topics of dialogue that aren't necessarily the biggest issue for me, but I know that for some people, those are kind of touchy points. Because uh, I, I want to spend the, the bulk of this last week, though, uh, you know, uh, pointing out some strong points of orthodoxy as well, okay? So this is not just going to be a, a bash fest. I'm just saying, like, we're looking at things critically, but not, not judgmentally, okay? Uh, so don't think that this is me telling you not to join orthodoxy, if that's something you wanted to do. Look, do whatever you want. Be Catholic, Presbyterian. I mean, my business, okay? I'm just giving some overall thoughts and opinions because people ask. But as they say, opinions are like sphincter bins. Everyone has one. I'm just saying, don't hand over your discernment to the control of your denomination, whichever one you choose, okay? That's not a good trade. Now, we left off last week, and I was talking about their idea, the orthodox idea of theosis, which is amazing, which is great. The orthodox idea that humanity is called to become divine. And although this sounds trippy to Western minds, it is the very gospel. So many church fathers said that God became man so that men would become divine. But I also pointed out the problem in the approach to theosis which so often mirrors what we in the West have is this evangelical problem of so-called sanctification where we religiously think that there's this lifelong process and struggle and gradual attainment to become holy with a lot of self-denial and surrender and carry your cross, brother, and mortification. And it goes, it flies in the face of the finished work of the cross because you have been made holy. You are blameless. And so we end up essentially saving ourselves through this humanistic process of religion and we forget Jesus's whole role in this equation, okay? And so that's what I was saying with, with the Orthodox. I just feel like with theosis, there tends to be this, it doesn't tend to be, it's pretty spelled out in the books that it's this lifelong process of gradual attainment and, and self-denial. And, and now this, you know, we discussed this last week and it, it leads to my next concern, which is a soteriological concern. And soteriology is our theology of salvation, how salvation works. And this has to be by far 
my largest and most crucial concern for my Orthodox brothers. It's probably my main and primary reason that I haven't just taken the sprinkle and joined the Orthodox Church. It's connected to this similar vein of process we just talked about and their doctrine of theosis, of becoming godlike or putting on divinity. And salvation itself also entails this long road of work or at least there's some human effort involved. There's a heavy focus on asceticism, fasting, all the time. Orthodox, they fast more than 180 days a year. And this becomes extremely Gnostic, beating up the physical in order to gain the spiritual. Now, at least Orthodox priests, they can take a wife, unlike our Catholic brothers. I mean, they aren't that Gnostic. <laughs> you know, take that out of the picture and you could be hella sure I ain't coming close to no Orthodoxy. So look, at least they can be married. But, but their so-called renunciation of this world can be just as dualistic as, as the West is chock full of dualism and religion. So it's funny because... Uh, you know, such a strong appeal in orthodoxy to the church fathers like Athanasius and what Christ has vicariously done for us in the incarnation and our inclusion in him as attested to by so many church fathers. And yet there's still just too much now over the years has crept in of what I need to do and too little of what Christ has done on my behalf. It ironically gets wrapped all up in there. So again, we needed a Martin Luther. We needed a Reformation. And one of the calls of the Reformation, sola fide, faith alone. In fact, you're not even saved by faith. You can't believe on your own worth a hill of beans. No, you are saved by grace. Total free gift through faith. Faith is the lens by which we see this free grace. It's already hit us. It even takes his faith, his free gift of grace to save us. But by no means is one single link in the chain of salvation left up to my fasting, my asceticism, my self-denial, my willpower or lack thereof in order to climb a ladder up to God. Now, I'm not saying that my Orthodox brothers aren't gracious, and I'm not saying they don't have a concept of grace, and I definitely don't mean to stereotype them all, because there are plenty of Orthodox who, you, you know, actually have a, a bit of a, a reformed-oriented, you know, perspective. But I am talking about the big picture trend across the board internationally of Orthodox as a whole. I'm sure there are many more graciously oriented streams present in there, especially in the English-speaking Western Orthodox camps, which I've already said are a lot more ecumenical and can get along with others. But they sure wouldn't say that you're saved by works. But there becomes this overemphasis that, you know, grace is to do works. Now, yes, I agree. It is fully agree. There is grace to do works. We're empowered by grace. But those works, empowered by grace or not, are still not salvific. My response to grace is not what saved me, but grace himself. Jesus saved me, period. His response to the Father saved me. And now, works are fruits of righteousness. Not works to get righteousness or get holiness. Uh, and another thing with soteriology, again, uh, their doctrine of salvation, is that they, they tend to conflate their soteriology with their ecclesiology. Now, big words, okay, again, I, I explain when I throw out a four-syllable word. This means they conflate salvation with their doctrine of the church. Moreover, with being a member of the Orthodox Church itself. The role of the Orthodox brand of church is paramount. No salvation outside of orthodoxy. But guys, salvation is rooted in Christ alone. It doesn't hinge on our brand of club. As important as the church is, our role as the church 
is merely a participatory one in declaring and embodying the person and work of Christ. But the church is a lot bigger and broader than most Orthodox imagine. We who follow Christ, we are all one mystical body. Now remember, if you didn't listen last week, I also picked on the Catholics and the Protestants for believing the same thing, that they alone are the only Christians. As for the Orthodox, though, um, this does tend to be a bigger deal on the whole. And I don't think their recognition of the importance of the church is, is horribly bad, but <clears throat> they're only recognizing one small part of the church as being the church themselves. <laughs> so this goes back to my big concern I had last week about uh, ecumenism, about getting along all of us as members of Christ's body, despite the denomination. For the Orthodox, the exclusivity that is so rampant there, and again, I know exclusivity is a big problem in any denomination, so I'm not just picking on these guys, I say it again, uh, it's just that it gets dangerous when it's enshrined in the dogma that if you aren't baptized into one flavor of Christianity, you are not a Christian. So their ecclesiology, their theology for the church is real wobbly when you think you're saved only by church membership and that they are the only church and maybe um, they were their only church in their region in Bulgaria 800 years ago. But we, we should have a more generous understanding these days of what constitutes the Church of Jesus Christ. Again, I think we've just learned uh, to move further along here in this area here in the Western world. And this is one area I'd have to say that the West is probably stronger than the East when it comes to unity. Uh, I know it may not seem like it. You look at Facebook, <laughs> uh, wh where we have a new denomination springing up every week. It, you know, it's actually caused us to learn to have to agree to disagree, but still treat one another as family. I mean, you can get on Facebook and argue with somebody till the cows come home, but at the end of the day, you're, you'll still, you know, mutter, "All right, well, I guess they're still a Christian, so I'll have to get over it." And everybody recognizes the problem with denomination, denominal, denominationalism, and splits. Everybody recognizes that, and, and 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 that's part of what makes the Orthodox Church seem appealing because they boast in this unbroken stream all the way back to the Church Fathers. But here in the West, most Christians have begun to learn that my stream is not the only stream, and we need to reach across the aisle a bit. So again, we need ecumenism. I can't hammer that topic enough when talking about orthodoxy. We need dialogue with the entire body of Christ to help see each other's blind spots, okay? And so few people actually branch out to learn from all streams of the church and thereby see the clearer, all the more clearer, that the plumb line, which is Jesus and the Trinity. And, and, and guys, I, let me say, I might take pot shots at evangelicals. I do it a lot. I definitely take shots at charismatics, but probably more so because I am in the charismatic stream, so I have a little more flexibility to critique my own house, but I'm not just tearing down to tear down. It's actually to build up and reform and bring us back to a revelation of the gospel. So again, any critiques here? of my Orthodox brothers is only to build up and to bridge unnecessary schisms and learn from one another, okay? We've been separate for too long and it's just not gonna fly in the days to come. One time I was uh, on a fishing boat in Alaska where I worked for a summer as a young man and I, I worked aboard with a, a, an Orthodox brother and I was talking to him one day and I said, uh, I said, I really, I really believe that the church is going to be united one day. I just don't know how it's going to happen. And he looked at me like I was an idiot. He was like, oh, you don't know? Holy Spirit's going to make it happen. <laughs> and, and that is the truth. And I want to be able to drink from every string of the church. And you can eat the meat and spit out the bones, no matter the denomination. I can glean from patristics, from orthodox theologians. I can consider them brothers. I greatly appreciate their worship style, but I don't feel a pressure to join the club because I'm already in, and so are you. We're in, we're in, we're in Christ Jesus. 
once you know the finished work, gospel of grace, it is hard to put the toothpaste back into the tube, my friend, and think you need a box in order to cement your spirituality. If I ever did join the Orthodox Church, it would just be for fun because I, I couldn't honestly be in agreement with everything. And so it would just seem a little disingenuous for me to mouth things that I didn't agree with. The church needs continual reformation. So I'd probably get excommunicated real quickly. But let's move on now to some even even tougher topics since we're, we're just treading here. Okay, another bigger area uh, probably for me, there would be a roadblock for me in this is the, the Mariology, okay? Uh, the adoration of Mary. Now, it's not quite as extreme in orthodoxy, I should say, as it is in Catholicism, but it would still be a sticky point for anybody with Protestant sensibilities who would consider that a bit cultish, okay? Th this is always one of those topics, though, that is so hot button and has been so fought over that I don't want to beat a dead horse and make it a further point of division, okay? We just have to agree to disagree, all right? You want to pray to Mary? I'm not, I'm not like bugged by that, okay? In Protestant Catholic dialogue, for instance, you know, Protestants will just go straight to that issue of so-called Mary worship and insist that all Catholics aren't Christians. And it's a, this definitely an issue, but I'd say the bigger issue, what do you do with Jesus, Okay, do, do they hold Mary in too high of a mediatorial role? I would say yes, but it is Jesus alone that they worship as God. And that is where we can agree. That is where we take our common ground as fellow Christians, as brothers. I know plenty of Baptists who worship their own personal decision for Jesus as the ground of their salvation. So they're essentially worshiping their own willpower, their own self. If we want to have a discussion about idolatry, there's idolatry in every camp, okay? All religion is idolatry of self. So look, it's sometimes just more enshrined than others. With this Mary thing, you know, the early church was not as hung up on rosaries and prayers to Mary. Uh, there was an ancient church heretic, Nis, <laughs> Nis, <laughs> excuse me, there was an ancient church heretic, Nestorius, who actually many scholars agree was probably not really a heretic at all. He just got accused of saying something that he wasn't actually saying. And that's my perspective on Nestorius. Nestorius was a bishop. He was appointed politically by Rome around 427 AD, appointed over some churches that were so far away in Persia and in India. He probably didn't even speak the language. He didn't know the people he was pastoring. He'd never been there. It was just a very political time. Things were weird. Think 2016 elections. Anything can happen. But when he heard his churches were referring to Mary as the Theotokos, the mother of God, he immediately began teaching that she should rather be called the mother of Christ because he saw that they were so close to deifying Mary by calling her mother of God. Now, Nestorius believed in the same thing about Christ as other Christians. He believed Jesus was fully God. He believed Jesus was fully man. He wasn't denying the divinity of Jesus, and he even agreed, technically, Mary can be called the Theotokos because Christ is divine. He is God. She is his mother. Technically, yeah. But he just said this kind of language, it could lead to a misconception that she is God or she preceded God or something. But, but things were so politically hot. Nestorius's opponents, they didn't take time to work through the language and, and the real issue he was trying to address. They just said, you're a heretic. You don't believe in the divinity of Jesus because you can't say Mary is the mother of God. You're saying Jesus isn't God. And, and, but really his concern was about how people were relating to Mary, not Jesus. And it really wasn't until the Reformation, like a thousand years later, that folks were like, hey, you know, maybe we have taken this Mary thing a little too far. Maybe Nestorius was actually on to something. So for me personally, while there's a genuine appeal to orthodoxy in so many ways, I, I can't 
talk myself around the Marian hurdle when I think, well, could I work myself into like technically being orthodox? But again, agree to disagree, okay? And I'm not burning anybody at the stake for this. I'm definitely not trying to fix anybody. So pray your rosary away if it, you know, <laughs> if you get your rocks off on it, okay? And this leads to a similar topic not that the Orthodox do rosaries, but anyways, this leads to a similar topic. The Orthodox view on the cloud of witnesses, the, the participation with the saints, okay? There's this whole thing about, do they intercede for us? Do we intercede to them? I get the paradigm for that. I Even, even a degree of interaction with the cloud as a charismatic, I, I know they are somehow here cheering us on. I, but I'm not one who is, you know, into any need to pray to saints or request their help. I, I understand the critique that this would be necromancy, communicating with the dead. But I also understand the orthodox position that the saints who've gone before us are not the dead, but the living. Not the biggest deal for me either way, okay? I'm not telling you what to think in this area, but you can think for yourself, okay? For me though, when it pulls away from the revelation of my union with Jesus, like, and, I, and, and I've got to like focus on talking to St. Andrew or whatever, I mean, like I, I really can rely on Jesus's intercession alone, his prayer to the Father to make us one in, in, with the Godhead. I, this is where I think the paradigm can detract from the main thing for a lot of people. And it just gets into unnecessary side stuff. So I, I think it just depends really on how much you focus on it. So yeah, I do believe in the cloud of witnesses and their participation. And I've experienced some pretty trippy stuff I'm not even gonna talk about right now. But um, some people are gonna be more superstitious than others on this topic. A lot of charismatics get really weird with this topic. Orthodox though, they do not worship saints, okay? But they do appreciate their contribution. Even Protestants appreciate the contribution of those who've gone before us. It just might not be quite as mystical, okay? We, we definitely don't need them as agents or middlemen because God's distant from us. But yes, God does use people. So there can be dialogue here, you know, about the, the degree to which we may or may not, um, uh, you, you know, uh, interact or whatever, or however, with those who've gone before us in a mystical way. I've had strong opinions on this in the past, but it's honestly a little irrelevant to me now. So I'm just obsessed with the light bearer himself. So I'm not, I'm not telling you what to believe. I'm just throwing this out here, opinions, okay? Now, uh, as I said at the top, these past few topics here in part two, I'm, I'm offering a few more critiques than positives. I was more into the positives of orthodoxy on part one. And don't forget, all right, my fat, lazy keister hiked Mount Athos, okay? I don't think I'm being dismissive of orthodoxy here, all right? Let me say where I absolutely do appreciate orthodoxy, maybe number one, it's their value. And for the sacred mystery, their grid and their love for the practice of the presence of God, their grid for the supernatural is such a rich, mystical, contemplative tradition in orthodoxy. You know, I'm hanging with these monks and brother, they are whacked. You can call it what you want. Now, it's not exactly what we'd see in a Crowder meeting where they're rolling around, barking and laughing on the floor, but the, they are very presence-oriented, all right? Maybe they're not flopping on the ground, but man, they're trancing out in worship. They are very aware of the presence. The Orthodox are far more prone to talk about the active work of Holy Spirit than many evangelicals. And they've got all these mystical practices, the hesychism, and I'm, I'm, I don't have time to get into it all. But this may also, you know, uh, depend on the local Orthodox congregation. Because like any stream of the church, some are going to be more formal and stuffy and ritualistic. Some are going to be more charismatic and lively. It depends from place to place where you go. It's not just a flat line. You can't stereotype everybody under one denominational blanket. So I'm talking in big pictures here. All right. So if you're Orthodox, listen to this. Bless you. I'm not picking on anybody. All right. All right. I, I, I'm just I'm, I'm actually trying to encourage everybody. So as, as I said before. As with any mystical stream in the church, okay, whatever the denomination, there can be a tendency to split 
our spirituality from our earthly lives as humans and try to live in the clouds rejecting creation. And I think with all the fasting and asceticism and the beating up of the body, it, there's kind of a, you know an, an emphasis of that. And I'm not saying Orthodox do this wholesale. In fact, Orthodox monks, I've found they tend to be a little more relatable than the Catholic monks that I've met. They, they tend, as a whole, they, and I've, I've met a lot of monks, they tend to... Uh, interact more with secular people. They don't mind having conversations. Now, they don't take vows of silence as much as the Catholics, so that might have something to do with it. But, you know, in many ways, the Eastern Orthodox are exactly the opposite of Western Christians uh, because, you know, they reject a lot of the dualisms we have, these, these mindsets of separation from God that they have. For them, God is everywhere. They're always in God. Uh, even though, you know, they got to beat themselves up. To, <laughs> I don't know. So, so they, they do believe that God permeates all of creation and all things are held together in him. They rightly point out the dualisms or the separations in our Western version of Christianity. They point out how we so wrongly lean heavily on human philosophy instead of the gospel, which we do in the Western world, sadly. But sadly, Often, the Orthodox don't recognize the dualisms in their own stream, their own ideas of separation from God. Like on the one hand, he's everywhere. They're in him. He's in, 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 in a, and, and at the same time, they've got to climb this mount to theosis. They've got to, you know, work their salvation. And so they don't recognize also how they lean so much on philosophy a bit themselves. You see, it's funny how we can see the errors in others, but not always in ourselves. Isn't that something? And it's the same with denominations and camps. One of the biggest areas where I would say the Orthodox lean on philosophy and dualism is in this really big concept they have where they talk about God's essence and his energies. Now, I'm not going to go deeply into this, but I do know a couple theological nerds that are watching this that actually want to know what I think about it. Okay, Around the time that the Western church started really getting re-obsessed with philosophy again in the Middle Ages with guys like Thomas Aquinas. Okay, you know where we're going to figure God out with the human mind. Well, over in the East, one of the more popular Orthodox theologians, more popular than, than a lot of guys in the Orthodox world, Gregory Palamas, well, he himself was leaning quite heavily on human philosophy also, I dare say. And so he had these ideas that God's essence, his presence, his, his being, you should say, was different from his energies. And the world, he interacts with the world through his energies energies, but not necessarily direct contact with his presence. Now, he would say the presence is in the energies. It's, you know, it, it, I, I'm not going to get into it all in detail, but it ends up being just a lot of metaphysical guesswork at the end of the day. And I think T.F. Torrance was right in his critique and saying that, that Gregory put a dualism between God and creation because you're sitting God in a place where he's separate, his actual presence isn't active in the world, but just his energies are engaging with things. And for our Orthodox brothers, they really get into this essence energies thing because you know, uh, but you know, God doesn't hold the cosmos together, guys, with some abstract energies, okay? It is held together by the incarnation of Jesus Christ. So Torrance is actually reminding his Orthodox brothers to get back to their basics, back to Athanasius, to remember the first thing on their own priority list. Plus, Torrance points out that they're splitting God's person from his activity by separating his being from his energy. And, and, and when it comes to his interaction with the world, you can't rip it all apart. Listen, you are not in union with some abstract energy of God. You are in union with God himself. This gospel is deeply personal. So anyway, while our Orthodox brothers, they have some areas of dualism, Okay, there are other areas where the West has dualism and, and oftentimes they're not in the same 
the same trains of thought. So that's where, again, we can help each other with our blind sides. And, and, and here's another topic for both sides where we can learn from one another. Uh, here we go. Evangelism. With evangelicals, there is always a major, major focus on getting converts, growing churches, bringing people in the doors, hence the name evangelical. There's a huge focus on evangelism. Not so much in the Orthodox Church. In a sense, this is refreshing. They're just chill. In fact, most videos you watch on converting to orthodoxy, the priest will usually say, eh, take your time, wait a year, read, study, pray about it first. They figure Holy Spirit will pull it off if it should happen. <laughs> they just aren't as pushy with their proselytizing, which could be really refreshing for somebody who's coming from the dog and pony show of doing anything, even resorting to manipulation just to get warm bodies in the door. I mean, pushing people on Jesus like a used car salesman or a door-to-door -door Tupperware distributor replete with all these mega church gimmicks of fireworks and light show entertainment spectacles of seeker sensitivity just to win converts. The Orthodox are super relaxed on that. Their main focus is not really on evangelism, if they focus on that at all. Rather, they're, it's, it's on, on the worship of God himself. That, that's their priority, which I, I actually think uh, prioritizes the first commandment of loving God over the second commandment, loving your neighbor, wherein the Great Commission should be rightly situated. The second commandment, a byproduct of loving God. Okay, not the main thing. But anyways, a part of the negative side of it, I mean, they, they can kind of make it hard for you to get included into a community a bit cloistered. It's like another world and you're all thumbs trying to even figure it out. And, and you may even be viewed with skepticism as an outsider if you walk in the door on some given Sunday. And, and this can be um, more complicated since the Orthodox Church is usually divided up by ethnicities and language. For instance, in your city, you may have a Ukrainian Orthodox Church a Serbian Orthodox Church, a Russian Orthodox Church. They're all Orthodox. They're all the same thing. But um, especially in America, there's not always a lot of options. So maybe the only Orthodox Church near you may primarily be geared for immigrants of one particular nationality, and the services aren't even necessarily in English. So if you want to go to heaven, you got to get baptized in there and learn Serbian to get anything out of it. Anyway, I, I, I think we arrive at a healthier place when we take the best of both worlds on this issue, because evangelism is important and there is a vital place of participating in the Great Commission. But at the same time, we're ultimately trusting Holy Spirit to do the work in people's hearts. We put the message out there, but it's not in this sweaty frenzy of pressure to talk about Jesus in a three minute soundbite to every person you meet in the shopping mall or, or sit next to you on a plane. I, I, we can relax, take a chill pill a little bit as evangelicals, okay? And, and for the Orthodox, may do well to look a little outside their four walls a bit, okay? So we can learn from each other. It also helps in the Protestant world that we have a, a better grid for the priesthood of the believer. Um, so the entire body here, because we have that, I think the entire body in the Protestant world is more prone to getting activated and doing the stuff of evangelism. And unlike our Orthodox brothers, we're not holding on to what could become sort of a hierarchical one-man priesthood model, which is another topic we could talk about, but I won't get into that. We're running out of time. Look, here's just a few more random side issues I want to shotgun blast through before we wrap it up, okay? Maybe segueing from that priesthood thing. In the Orthodox Church, uh, there's definitely a huge focus on spiritual fathers. And I actually appreciate the paradigm of mentorship and honoring leaders, especially in today's culture of cynicism towards leadership. There actually is a wholesomeness uh, you know, that, that we've sort of shirked in our rugged individualism. However, as with any denomination, it can be a bit controlling, heavy-handed, if someone wants to abuse it. And unfortunately, we know that people do like to abuse a power, okay? So of course, codependent, um, um, you know, when we think of 
relationship with, with God, uh, that, that we can't have it with, without some inappropriate dependency on another man. Uh, codependency can happen, all right? So what else? Maybe I should cover a few more little peripherals just regarding their practice, orthodox practice real quickly, uh, that some folks will want to hear about. Now, again, I'm not orthodox. I'm, I'm coming to you from my perspective. I'm just giving you my opinion. People want to hear my opinion, right, for what it's worth. Icons, okay, what about icons? I, I personally love icons as art and even as a devotional reminder. They set an atmosphere in my house, in my office. I have tons of them, okay? I even understand kissing them, okay? I may have kissed one before. In an Orthodox service, you kiss everything with no rhyme or reason. People are kissing the walls, kissing everything. They're doing the crossing. Okay, Orthodox are smart enough to know you don't worship a picture, okay? For the Orthodox, it's an act, a point of contact. The word worship actually means kiss toward, okay? They are not worshiping the icon. They're kissing mwah, toward Christ or whatever in a, in a representative way, okay? So just to throw that out there. Charismatics, they raise their hands, okay? They wave banners. It's just a form of worship. They could look silly to some people or, oh, you're worshiping a flag or why are you raising your hands? You're gonna catch God. There, there's a lot of superstition as well among some, right? Yeah, of course, I get it. There's superstition in every stream. Every denomination has their good luck charms and their talismans and, and people think they're chasing the devil off with their prayer banner. Yeah, he's really scared of those. So look, I understand that icons could be a big deal for some, not the biggest deal for me, all right? I just, it's not, it's just not an issue, okay? Uh, speaking of demons, scaring off the devil, I found the Orthodox can also have just as much paranoia over demons, spiritual warfare, as your average charismatic uh, Christian, okay? So just wanted to throw that in there. They're actually very charismatic, very, very much like charismatics. Another big topic when it comes to orthodoxy is the connection with the state. That's something to bring up. Uh, in some countries over the years, especially like in Greece, or man, for sure, Russia, there's been a lot of problems with you know the orthodox church and the state being in bed together. I mean, priests were literally spies for the KGB in almost every church in communist Russia. But we can't pick on the Orthodox strictly over this, because, I mean, look at Roman Catholicism. Look at Protestant state persecution of Catholics. I mean, I don't see this church-state connection as being something you can strictly single out uh, the Orthodox over, okay? But just, you know, something to acknowledge here. There, there's It could be problematic. And one other thing, when people think of Orthodoxy, uh, they may think, of uh, one of the main things they think of at times is the Jesus prayer or the Kyrie eleison. You know, as an Athos and the monks all day, they repeat it. You know, Kyrie eleison means Lord have mercy. Kyrie eleison, Kyrie eleison, Kyrie eleison. It's like, they're, they're saying it so fast. It's just like, Kyrie eleison, Kyrie eleison, Kyrie eleison, Kyrie eleison. In case like one second, the Lord, they skip a beat and the Lord doesn't have mercy. That second, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. And, <laughs> and the Jesus prayer is very similar. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And it is on repeat, 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 repeat as, as a mantra. Well, hey, good news. Guess what? He has. <laughs> Pray that. Great. Okay, that's fine. But don't underestimate Jesus. Don't underestimate what he's done. Don't be superstitious with it. As if by repetition in our prayers, we're going to be heard as the pagans believe. No, say it. If you're going to say it, say it as a declaration, as a proclamation. The Lord has had mercy. We are declaring the all-encompassing mercy of Christ to a broken world. So, man, guys, boom, there it is. Why I love the Orthodox Church so much. Why I love not being Orthodox. And hopefully a few admonitions that we should all just get along, learn from each other, love each other, hopefully start to break bread with one another. No church, no denomination is perfect, but in Christ, we are all perfect, seated in heavenly places, his spotless bride. We are already one mystical body in Christ. From his perspective, we are already in unity. Therefore, let us pray and work towards seeing an outward unity, a visible communion in recognizing Christ in one another as brothers, 
who dwell together in unity as a precious oil flowing over our high priest down his beard and robe. Let's see Jesus drenched in the good oily pleasure of having all his children living in loving communion with one another. Christ is not divided. We are one. Holy Spirit, help us to see, all of us. Imagine how the father feels when one of his sons says that the other is not in his family simply because he beholds a facet of his father's face more brightly than the other. Guys, if you dug this deep into this two-part series already, you may have a problem like me. You might just like all things Jesus and every stream, every denomination of the church. You may like to drink your grace straight with no religious mixture, but digging out those nuggets wherever you can find them. And if so, I would like to mention a few things that are going to be right up your alley where you can come party with us. You know, we've been talking about church fathers, talking about patristics. We actually have a few spots still open for our conference, The Creed, a three-day conference on the Nicene Creed, exploring the glory of the ancient faith. It's a conference coming to Bristol, England this August with Baxter Kruger, Godfrey Bertel, and myself. And I just mentioned that we have only last week announced a USA version of the Creed. We just threw this out there, this hot off the press, okay, after much desire to see the Creed come to the States. The Creed USA is actually going to be in New England in October, my only New England event. It's coming to Massachusetts, and you can find it at thenewmystics.com slash USA. And guys, this ain't just theology, all right? This is mystical. It's supernatural. It is experiential. God is cross-pollinating the theological and the mystical today. And let me tell you, it's going to look a lot like Jesus. I have one mystical school coming to America this year. It's going to be in Detroit, Michigan. It's in October. It's my one and only Midwest event for 2019. And mystical schools, if you're wondering, are three-day supernatural equipping events. And if you're in Europe... I actually have a mystical school coming to Germany in September. And also for those of you guys who want a deeper two-year plunge into finished work gospel drinking that is experiential and presence-oriented and seeks to find Jesus in many different streams of the church, not just one camp, we have a Holy Spirit-saturated theological school that is an online course you can actually do from your own home at your own pace. It's just one session a week. Real easy to do no matter what your job. It's called Cana New Wine Seminary. And we have some amazing teachers with live Q&A each semester. Cana kicks off in October as well. But if you sign up right now, go to cana.co. You can actually get the early bird discount rate on your tuition. We try to make this very affordable for people. We want as many people in here as possible. You're not going to find another seminary that's this cheap, actually. So check it out, cana.co. And also, while you're here, remember, we have one and only one mission trip that is currently open to applicants where you can physically come with me and be part of the mission team. And this is going to be a smaller group. And so I've said, look, we're, we're going to have a lot of one-on-one -on -one time together. We're actually going to Africa. Two nations on one trip, Africa and Cameroon. So if you've got a desire for missions, no better place to start than to get your deposit in, get your application in. That's what it takes to lock in your spot on the team. But we do need that from you literally right now. Because if you've procrastinated on this, I hate to tell you, get on it. This is literally the last chance because the deadline for the deposit is this week, June 14th. It could be today when you're watching, okay? So you still got plenty of time to get all your funds together and make your plans, all right? The trip's not till November. It's not that big of a rush. The, the rush is just to sign up pronto, get your foot in the door by June 14th. Thenewmystics.com slash Africa. Okay, so those are the events that we have on the calendar. Uh, I'm also going to be in Russia. I'm going to be in Poland, Latvia, Ukraine, uh, Moldova, lots of other spots. If you go to our event page, you can find all of our events, thenewmystics.com slash events. Everything is on that page. And if you're in America, if you're in Australia, um, you know, there's a lot of good stuff on the event page. I would encourage you to 
be part of Cana Online. I encourage you to join the African mission trip. But if you're in America or if you're in Australia, the one big conference event that I would most encourage you to attend is to pull aside for an entire week and come to Telos. That's right, I said a week, an entire jam-packed, seven-day, intensive, Holy Ghost, glory fest. It, it, expect a supernatural, miraculous atmosphere and expect an absolute mind-blowing theological bliss explosion going off in your head, okay? Because this thing, you're going you're gonna to connect with a lot of fun people uh, of the same stream, same DNA, but it is going to be a foundational course that I guarantee will rock your world. The Telos USA is really coming up soon. It's next month in Atlanta in July. It's not just for Georgia people. Atlanta is the biggest airport in America. Easy to catch a flight last minute. Come to Atlanta in July. And if you're in Australia, catch the Telos Australia in Sydney. That'll be in December. So if you haven't heard about it, if you haven't heard about Telos, just quickly uh, check this out. Telos, the end, objective, purpose, or aim. Jesus Christ is the consummation and summation of all things, the objective of the cosmos. The world was created that Christ may be born. The way we think about God in the Western world needs to be restructured from the ground up, whether liberal or conservative, fundamentalist or postmodern. We need our ways of thinking re-evangelized from the bottom to top. Some folks are aimless with no purpose, others are religiously purpose-driven, humanistically striving for God. But Christ himself is the message, not faith, not repentance. It is Christ and his relationship with his Father in the Spirit, which he vicariously fulfills in us, created in and restored to the divine image, the fulfillment of the law, the end of religion, and by the Spirit, union and adoption are ours in him. He is the restoration of all things, the completion, the end, the eschaton, the omega, the word, the very logic of God, the ultimate goal, the purpose of all human history, the intention, the telos. However, it takes time to reform centuries, even millennia of toxic thinking, to revisit the flaws of one broken religious self-effort humanistic doctrine, the entire sweater begins to unravel. This is why for a decade, the format of our three-day intensive mystical schools has been so fruitful, life-changing, because we have hours to unpackage more Christological ways of thinking, exploring the gospel of who he is and his finished work. The gospel changes everything. And it must be done in an atmosphere that is experiential, wherein we taste of our union with God, not just talk about it. We need Holy Spirit, not just doctrine, but substance. But even with a three-day school, my time is limited. There are so many questions that linger, concepts that need exploring. We've been so indoctrinated. The vision of our online Cana New Wine Seminary e-course was for this very thing, to take people through a longer, two-year journey of reframing everything through the simplicity of Christ crucified in the life of the Trinity, alongside many other great teachers. And not everyone can commit to two years, or they want faster, more concentrated dosage of religious detox. The mystical school is not long enough, and Cana may seem too long. These are great formats, but I've really felt strategy from the Lord, at least for a few dozen people ready to take the plunge because people can pull aside for a jam-packed, week-long, intensive course of butchering sacred cows and proclaiming a straight, unadulterated gospel of grace that is unfiltered by the pagan concepts of separation that have infected every stream of the Christian church. And all of this saturated in a supernatural, miraculous atmosphere. I would like to invite you to a very unique opportunity called Telos. Part theological boot camp, part Holy Ghost camp meeting. It is seven days of nonstop gospel glory. This is a destination event where you'll pull aside for a week and fly in. It's not a regular course. I'll be taken on the road to a city near you. We have only two of them. One on either side of the world, specifically near major airport hubs in 2019. One is in Atlanta, Georgia, USA, July 14th through the 20th, 
the other in Sydney, Australia, December 1st through the 7th. A mystical school on steroids and a Cana course concentrated into one compact week. This is an exclusive event with a strict limitation on the number of people, and the registration fee reflects this. We want people who are very intentional and committed, and we expect both of these to fill up quickly. Maybe some have done Cana or a mystical school, but they want a fine tuning. They want a Holy Ghost reunion with other gospel drinkers. Maybe you are new to a finished work perspective. I'll have seven days to unleash a full barrage of everything I have, bringing us from a darkened mindset of separation to the awareness of a reality of a union with God. This will be revolutionary. It's a seven day foundations course. It'll be challenging and it'll be intoxicating. Tell us the end, objective, purpose or aim. Jesus didn't just bring a message, he is the message. He doesn't just invite us into this union with God, but he is the living, breathing, incarnate union between God and our humanity. Any theology, philosophy, or worldview that is not summed up in Jesus Christ and his finished work, as Torrance says, it throws men back upon themselves and their own religious efforts. Telos is about making Christ the lens by which we see everything. He is the Telos. Sons of Thunder runs on partnerships and generous contributions from people like you. If you've been blessed by the ministry and want to participate in sharing the gospel and reaching the poor with us, consider becoming a monthly supporter at thenewmystics.com slash partners.